are back here at the Pick IT conference in our Spotlight interview booth and I am really thrilled to have here Kirk Pepperdine with us. And probably if you are a Java developer, you heard about him because he's performance tuning Java applications for something like 20 years, I guess. Yeah, more than. Uh, and he's also one of the main uh, people behind the Java performance tuning.com website. And we are really thrilled to have you in Brasov at the PKT conference. And thank you very much for joining us here in the Spotlight interview. Let's take off. Oh, yeah. Thank you for having me here. It's uh, been a fun trip so far. Okay. How, how do you like Brasov for now? Is it is, is for you the first time here or? It's my first time here. And uh, yesterday I had a workshop. And when I finished the workshop, I went for a walk. And I found that there's a mountain out back here. Yeah. Well, a tall a hill. hill. Yeah. <laughs> Possibly a mountain. Yeah. And I decided to go right to the top and I was looking at the whole area here. And it's really, it's beautiful. It's, it's wonderful. It's an amazing view from Gear. Oh yeah. The, the old city and all of the farmlands, fields, other mountains. It's crazy. It's really nice. Cool. Really nice. I, I'm really happy that you enjoy it. But since you are here, obviously the first thing that I would like to talk a little bit about is Java and performance during Java. Now, Java is not my primary language as mm -hmm. a software developer, but it's something similar. So if I say something stupid, I apologize for that. <laughs> but uh, I think when we think about performance and memory management in Java, uh, there, there has been a huge journey, if you think, along the years. Oh, yeah. So probably a lot of developers have this kind of like fear or question, okay, I am uh, maybe a junior uh, Java developer, how can I make sure, for instance, that the applications that I'm writing, at least if they are not, let's say, performance optimized a lot or memory optimized, but at least that I don't do bad things. So what is one advice that you would give developers regarding the code that they should write to make sure that it kind of like doesn't become a memory nightmare? Uh, yeah, well, that's, that's, a, that's a really good question. I think the best thing that a young developer or any developer can do to make sure that Java doesn't become a memory nightmare is to use proper abstractions. Um, we see a lot of string abuse. Okay. So we, we're going to say that string is used as an abstraction for whole groups of things. And I would say, why? Why not just use something that represents the thing that you know, is part of your model instead of having a string represent it. Now, it might just be simply a wrapper over a string, uh, but the point is, is that um, when you're when you create this abstraction, you actually create better code. And if there's some issue with performance in the future, then it actually makes it a lot easier to optimize because you have things properly abstracted. You can see where the uh, the issue has gone wrong in the abstraction. You can just alter the abstraction. For example, if you look at our open source project GC Toolkit, we read lines of um, we read lines from log files, GC log files, right? So that feels like okay. Well, I'm reading a string from a file. It's like no, I'm reading a GC log line from a GC log file. Okay, and that's a completely different um, conversation than I'm reading a string from a file. And it also allows me to build uh, a bunch of abstractions in there. So it's like what kind of GC log file I have, right? That's actually nice. Uh, yeah. And it's like, you know, what is this GC log line? So now I can have, uh, you know, representations of these different things, which actually help me build the model. And it makes the code a lot more readable because I know exactly what I'm dealing with. If I'm just dealing with strings, I'm, I'm dealing with strings. Now under the hood, I'm dealing with strings, but that's not what's exposed. And that's just what I call good abstraction. Okay, there's there's one other question that's actually uh, bugging me a lot, and uh, I, I I'm running also my own YouTube channel, and I see this discussion a lot and get this question a lot, not only regarding Java but also to my primary language is C sharp, but I think it's kind of like the the a very similar thing. So if if we think recently during the last three or four years maybe in Java there were added a lot of uh, functional programming features, let's say, mm. like pattern matching, like even lambdas and, and so on. Mm. And I've heard some voices saying that, okay, functional programming is becoming kind of like the new cool thing. And that object-oriented uh, programming is kind of like losing its momentum a little bit. And even I've seen tech gurus on LinkedIn uh, saying that, hey, okay, 
you should all go to functional programming right now because all the languages are going there. So I want your personal insight on this. Do you think that Java will become more and more a functional programming language and less and less an OOP language? Or do you think these are just two paradigms that kind of like complement each other in, in Java? Okay. So first, a Java is not a pure OO language to begin with. Okay. Okay. And the things that we're missing, um, a, lot, a number of the things that are missing are the things that functional programming is bringing into the language that actually makes Java more OO than it actually was in, in the past. Um, so for me, uh, when it, what I see of functional programming is actually OO programming done properly. Properly. Okay. Okay. So I wouldn't actually call it uh, functional programming per se. Um, I would call it OO programming. So I think OO is getting stronger. It's just been relabeled. And yeah, there are some fundamental differences between um, func pure functional and like pure OO. Uh, but that's... That's not what's being added. I think what's being added is actually um, uh, OO features in language. Okay. So if I understand correctly, and I think that's a very nice take, is that actually these new functional programming features that bring to Java actually make it a better OO language. That's correct. That's that's a very good insight. Thank <laughs> you very much for, for that one. Yeah. Now, there is one one, one other topic that I would like to, to, to discuss with you very shortly is I know that you had some uh, quite good adventures in the startup world. Oh, yes. Uh, no. So <laughs> I'm literally here because recently I hear a lot of developers kind of like being very, very concerned. Like uh, right now, let's mm -hmm. say the market is not very stable. In the recent years, there's been a lot of layoffs and people start to turn their heads more towards startups. So should I start a startup? Um, is it a good idea or should I go work for a startup? So how do you think that startups might fit right now into the landscape of, of uh, IT in general? Well, I think um, what you see is the, the larger companies will invest in all kinds of different things, right? But a lot of what they invest in is uh, legacy and they'll they'll support a lot of research so there's actually some interesting new stuff coming uh, you know coming out of the research realm but uh, a lot of the innovation happens in startups and if you have that type of mindset uh, and you're willing to take the risk you know not everyone can take the risk because you know it's fairly it's a fairly risky venture uh -huh. um, like nine out of ten startups will fail within the okay. first year um, you have to, there's a lot of things you have to have set up correctly. And I mean, getting laid off is kind of like, you know, um, not a nice situation, but, uh, sometimes these layoffs come with payouts that last a fair period of time. Um, and you can take that time and basically be kind of depressed about being laid off because it's not a nice thing to happen, even though it happens to just about everyone. Yeah. Um, or you can look at that and say, cool, I now have two months or one month or however long that duration is where I can actually uh, take the time, take some of the ideas that I've had kicking around. And now I have time to actually to work, play, on to work on that uh, because, um, you know, I still have some income coming in. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm OK. And if I can figure out how to get an initial customer, um, uh, you, you know, very quickly from all of this work, uh, you know, from, from this, then, then that seems like the conditions where you could possibly launch a startup. But I would say that the, the biggest problem you're going to have with the startup is just simply going to be, you know, do you have the uh, financial wherewithal to withstand the time it takes to get things going so that you can, um, you know, start billing and receive getting cash flow going. And that's really the biggest yeah. problem, right? It's like, can I get keep the cash flow going uh, long enough to get this to a point where I can, where I can, you, you know, start seeing growth and, and stuff like that. Um, and you know, so I think layoff can be taken as a, you know, can be, time can be used to kickstart that. Um, so I wouldn't be dead set against it, but you have to recognize that there's a lot of risk in here, and not everybody wants to try to do something like that because. It takes a lot of uh, time, effort, um, yeah, just simply a lot of energy okay. uh, to, to, to make it all work. 
And the, the last thing regarding is you said that nine out of ten of ten startups usually fail. Mm -hmm. So what would be, from your experience, the most important advice that you would give somebody that wants to start uh, a startup and that kind of like, well, increases the probability that this startup will be the one that doesn't fail from 10? Don't run out of money. Okay. <laughs> that's uh, <laughs> obviously, yeah. Yeah, that's that's the, you know, and how do you not run out of money is, is um, there's there's two ends. There's in and there's out. out yeah. And the the first thing you do is you reduce the out as much as you can. And then you need to try to figure out how am I going to get a, a customer to sign up where I can start building up the end. Or eventually funding also from somewhere. Well, you know, that's another, you, when you build Story. a startup, when you build a startup, uh, you're building a company, which is a product. Yeah. It's a product you're selling to investors. Yeah. Uh, and you're also building the product that you're selling to other customers. Okay. Right. Um, now I'd say that, uh, since the product is not well developed, um, then you probably can't charge a lot for it, but when the product is well developed, then you can charge more for it. And that goes for the company and the product that you're building Yeah, in both cases. That's a very, very nice insight. Yeah. Thank you very much for taking the time uh, to answer this question. I think th th there were some very valuable answers. It was a pleasure meeting you and hope you will still or continue to enjoy your time here in Brussels for the rest of the day and tomorrow and for how long is that? Cool. Thank, <laughs> Thank you very, you very much. much then. Have a great day. You too. Bye. Bye now.